<laughs> what are you doing with all those devices? Oh, I'm watching Bulgarian Netflix on my phone, and on my laptop here, I'm watching a documentary that's only available in Pripyat. How is that possible? We are nowhere near Chernobyl. Oh, that's because I'm using Surfshark, my robot lady. Surfshark is an award-winning VPN that secures your digital life with top-of-the-line servers that encrypt your data and allow you to change your IP address on an unlimited number of devices to stay anonymous online and hide your true location. Hackers, streaming services, social media sites, they can't control what you see and do if they don't know where you are. If you want to try Surfshark, you can go down to the link in the description box below, tell them your boy sent you by using the offer code my name, Kyle, and get 83% off, three months free, and a free 30-day money-back guarantee. Uh, you're welcome. Now, Aria, why don't you start the episode? I need to pull up Australian Reddit on my watch. Yeah, it's upside down, but it's still good. <laughs> Well, Arya, it's time to settle in for the long haul to Proxima Centauri. Should I initiate suspended animation? Suspended anim- <laughs> No, how long can it really take 4.3 light years for a ship like this, you know? 69,420 years later. We're here. Oh. Uh... <clears throat> well, that took way too long, didn't it, dear viewer? We have a problem. If humanity is to ever brave the enormity of interstellar space, the basic spaceship concept and engine, like those that fill my hangar, simply are not going to cut it. No, we need, and I'm running out of clone versions of myself, no, we need some technology to come around and kick our technological butts into warp drive. And we're gonna learn all about warp drive today from the very scientist who popularized it. Welcome to the facility. First, why is warp drive a thing? Why do so many sci-fi stories like Star Trek incorporate it, and why do actual scientists publish actual papers on it? Well, the simple answer is distance. Let's say we wanted to go to the closest star outside of our own solar system. This is Proxima Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away, or 40 trillion kilometers. Right now, our fastest rockets have maximum velocities in the range of under 100 kilometers per second. Do the very simple math, and you see that you might have travel times just to the nearest star of tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Even at the speed of light, it would take you four years. And can you imagine spending 48 months in economy class? Ugh, no way. So to explore the cosmos efficiently, we simply must go faster, but faster in a specific way. See, if you get really close to the speed of light, you encounter relativistic problems. Problems like once you move really, really, really fast, time starts to slow down for you relative to the rest of the universe, and then you have an interstellar-like situation, and that's not all right, all right, all right. So what if instead of moving you through space, you move space through you? This is the central idea of warp drive, and to explain it and visualize it for you, I need a very expensive and very hard to find scientific instrument, a slinky. Imagine, if you will, that this slinky is some volume of space-time, and this Lego minifig represents you. You can imagine yourself moving through this volume of space-time like you would in a rocket ship or something like that. The problem here is, is that the vastness of space prevents anything like timely travel, even with the very best rockets. You simply do not have a hundred thousand years to sit in a spaceship next to a guy in disgusting shorts and sandals. So instead of moving you, let's move space-time. Warp drive is basically the attempt to realize the physics I'm about to show you. Now watch the position of the figure in this space-time volume as I do something very specific. I'm going to compress the space-time in front of you, which will expand it behind, okay? So watch, watch the position. Let's see that again. So if I compress space-time and expand it behind, see how the minifig moves even though it hasn't really moved in the usual sense? This is in effect warp drive. So you're not breaking any physical laws, and then you're not spending nearly as much time stuck next to that guy who is ordering way too many tiny wines on, and he's hogging the armrest and he, and he smells. 
If a warp drive could warp space-time in a specific way, it would solve some of the problems that we talked about. For one, inside of a warp bubble, if you will, inside of this compression and expansion of space-time, there is no time dilation for you. You and an outside observer would record the same passage of time, and there'd be no McConaughey situation. Everything would still be all right, all right, all right. It would also theoretically allow you to travel faster than the speed of light, because while nothing with mass, you can travel faster than the speed of light space itself can. Simply put, a warp drive in the best case scenario could get you to something 4.3 light years away, for example, in under 4.3 light years. Now, scientists have taken this possibility quite seriously for a long time. We even have simulations of what this warping of space-time would look like to the naked eye. Check it. Who says check it? What year is it? 2004? Just just play it. You can see that the warping of light is quite different from the warping you may have seen simulated around a black hole or a wormhole, and this is thanks to the specific bubble geometries required to make all of this work. These velocities even push past C, or the speed of light, because of what the warp drive is doing to space-time. Now, I should be very clear, putting a warp bubble around a spaceship theoretically is not the problem. There are many decades worth of research trying to figure out the actual solution to this problem, the most famous of which is the Alcubierre drive, first explored in 1994 by physicist Miguel Alcubierre. And even more recently, there have been not one but two papers trying to push more realistic warp drives even further. But all of these proposed solutions come along with their own problems. The Alcubierre drive requires negative energy, which isn't a thing, and the more recent papers need like the mass equivalent energy of Jupiter to work. So where is warp research today? How far can it go? Are we close? Well, I'm no expert, obviously, so why don't we talk to the man himself, physicist Miguel Alcubierre, to see what he thinks. Seriously? Does he know you're just like a dollar store Thor on the internet? Yeah, I know. We're really going to talk to him. Don't tell him who I am, though. He might just hang up the phone. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, before before we were, we were getting into it, I kind of laid out for my audience what Warp Drive is and why we want to do it. And I wanted to talk to you, who more or less single-handedly with your research popularized the most popular idea surrounding warp drive. Um, I kind of wanted to just quickly get your take for a general audience. Why do we want warp drive and why do we think about it? Why do distinguished scientists like yourself think about this thing? Yeah, why? Well, uh, I'm a fan of science fiction. So that, that's, that's the number one reason. I always watch Star Trek and read a lot of science fiction. <laughs> and in reality, the stars are very far away. And, and they are extremely far away. I mean, the closest star to the sun is four light years away. That means light takes four years to get there. And we know since the beginning of the 20th century, so over 100 years ago, that uh, nothing can travel faster than light according to, to relativity. And it's not just because Einstein said so. It, 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 the theory has been tested and tested and tested over 100 years, and it's never failed. So, so it, it is actually an empirical fact today. So that that puts us in a bit of a trouble because if we ever want to visit the stars and we can't travel faster than light, then it's going to be pretty boring. <laughs> it's going to be extremely hard to do. It, it, it's going to take forever to reach them. Even at the speed of light, it will take us years and, and normally we won't even be able to travel at that speed. So that put me to thinking maybe there's a way around it. And in fact, there is a way around it and we know about it and we've known about it for decades which is the, the expansion of the universe. The universe is expanding, we know that. And the, the galaxies that are far away from us move away from us very fast. And the furthest, if they're further away, they move faster away from us. And so a lot of people always ask, is it possible then to have a galaxy that's so far away that it moves away from us faster than light? And the answer is yes. And then they they uh, they, they ask, well, doesn't that violate relativity? And the answer is no, because it's space that is expanding. It's not so much the galaxy that's moving, it's space in between that is expanding and that doesn't violate any loss of relativity. But this happens at the scale of the cosmos at so an extremely large distance. So my idea was maybe maybe there's a way to make it happen at small distances. <laughs> so the 
expand space in a small region behind you and, and, and contract it in front of you. And that, that would allow you to travel in principle fast and light. Now, there's a lot of caveats, a lot of problems with the idea. It, it's not as simple as it sounds, but at, it, at, at least it tells you that it's not straightforward just to say that it's impossible. It's not quite mm. that straightforward. What are, what are some of the common pitfalls that people get wrong about what this could do or can't do? A lot of people think that traveling faster than light is just a matter of more technology and that eventually we will do it because technology is advancing all the time. It's not as simple as that. It, 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 I mean, this is a law of physics. So going around the law of physics, it's it's much more complicated than just <laughs> yeah, good, yeah, good luck. Engine, right? <laughs> so that that that's a, that's what, what people think a lot of the time. Also, they tend to think that I designed an engine or a spaceship. So they ask me, so when is your spaceship going to be ready? I have no idea. I didn't design a spaceship. I yeah. don't design engines. I'm not a, an engineer. What I did was I, I presented a, a scenario of what we would need to do to space, this expansion of space and contraction of space. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a geometry of space-time. So I, I, I thought of a geometry of space-time that would allow it. Now, how do you actually control the geometry of space-time at will? That's a that's the that's the engineer's matter. problem. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and I have no idea how to do it. People are calling it now just by a different name in, in the physics community, and I like it. They call it a warp bubble. Mm. It's not a drive because there's no engine that's ever been designed to do this, it, it, but it's a, a, a bubble of, of distorted space time geometry. So that, that makes more sense to me because we don't know how to create it, but if we could, it would be sort of a bubble of distorted space. Recently, like within the last month, there was not one, but two papers published trying yeah. to put warp drives or warp bubbles in a more uh, physical space or what they're calling a more physical space. I wanted to kind of get your idea on where yeah, that research I, is and where do you think it's going? Yeah, I, I read both papers. I mean, over the years, over the past 25 years, there's been many papers about it, about over 100, maybe 200 papers uh, of people looking at this idea. But the main problem, there's, there's actually several problems. One of the most important problems was the negative energy part. We don't think know of anything that has negative energy uh, for people uh, that don't know physics negative energy doesn't sound that strange right but uh, if, but if you remember e equals mc squared the famous equation of einstein that tells you energy and mass are equivalent negative energy would be equivalent to negative mass and that that should scare everyone right yeah no <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like dividing by zero <laughs> we shouldn't be doing that <laughs> exactly so uh, that's been the biggest hurdle and of these papers the one of them uh, actually looked at a very general class of, of geometries that they could think as sort of warp drive generalizations of the warp drive and they sort of did a classification and they showed that in some cases you could do, use this sort of idea of warp bubbles to travel slower than light using only positive energy mm -hmm. so i think that's interesting but uh, if you can only travel slower than light it's not terribly interesting but i i think the paper was nice i mean it was a nice paper with a lot of organization and they they did this classification of different ideas but the second paper actually is more interesting because it shows that you could travel faster than light with a warp bubble bubble using only positive energy this is a very complicated idea i mean it's actually the paper is very very technical uh, but in the end he shows he finds a solution in which you can have a warp bubble traveling faster than light with only positive energy so that's a huge advance i think but it's still Actually, in that paper, he shows that, yes, you, you could use positive energy, but if you wanted to move an object the size of a regular airplane with a warp bubble at, at exactly the speed of light, not even faster than light, but just at the speed of light, you, you would need positive energy equivalent to about uh, 20 or 30% of the entire mass of the sun converted into energy. Yeah, it's something, it's so. something like, a, <laughs> what it, it's, it's like a, it's like a trillion times more energy than like the gravitational binding energy of the planet. You know, exactly. it's, so it's, it's, some... it's a ridiculous. I mean, in its whole, in its whole life, the sun is not going to convert more than five percent of its total mass into energy. But this sure. thing, you would need twenty or thirty percent of the total mass of the sun converted into energy to move an object the size of an airplane at exactly the speed of light, not even faster. So it's still a huge problem, right? but at least it's positive energy. It, it also means that all my talks are wrong because whenever I talk about this thing, I say, I say you need negative energy, and now it turns out you don't. <laughs> But you still need huge amounts of positive energy, which still makes it completely impossible. It's not the only problem, there's other problems, but at least this one seems to have been solved uh, at, at least uh, in this conceptual way, right? Do you think that something like a warp bubble is ever going to be within our, you know, uh, the 
in practica, in, in, in practical engineering um, for humanity. Because as you were saying, um, the there's caveats on kind of both ends of the spectrum. It's either you need so much energy that it's ridiculous, or it's a yeah. kind of energy that doesn't exist. Um, exist do you yeah. think? Do you think that we're proceeding towards something like that? Because as you opened with, you know, even fusion drive isn't going to get us to the nearest galaxy or the nearest star in anything like oh. a human lifetime. So, um, do you think we might see this sometime in the future? As a physicist, as a scientist. I would have to say it's unlikely, or at least it looks unlikely at this point. But I, I hope that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep hoping that I'm wrong and somebody very clever in the future will find a way to do it. There's still things about the universe we don't really understand. We don't understand what's dark energy, we don't understand what dark star, dark matter is. Mm -hmm. And uh, even dark, dark energy would be interesting. Dark energy makes the expansion of the universe accelerate, so it means it has some sort of anti-gravity. So something like that, if it could ever, if it could learn what dark energy is and maybe control it, then maybe we could use it for something like this. But this is my hope. I and mean, as you mentioned, the fusion drive would be ideal to move inside the solar system. Yeah. If we had a fusion drive, we could, get, we could get to Mars in a matter of weeks or to Jupiter in a matter of a, a month or a couple of months. Without it, it would take 10 years to get to Jupiter. So a fusion drive would be fantastic for the solar system. But outside the solar system, there, there's nothing that wouldn't work at all. It would take still decades to get to the Alpha Centauri. So we, we really need the world drive at some point. And I do hope as a, as a Star Trek fan, as a science, fan, science fiction fan, that this will happen sometime in the future. But it's not sometime soon, right? If it turns out to be possible, it's still going to take us, I think, centuries. It's not around the corner. You're very enlightening, a very friendly and wonderful guy. I hope we can uh, talk again soon. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for the invitation to your program. <laughs> now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for the direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Chris Cavazos and visiting scholar Master Jeff. If you want to join me at the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, get behind the scene photos, talk with me on Discord, get videos early, see members only live streams of yours truly, not like that, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility staff today. And hey, if you support the facility just enough, you get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of you, so I have no idea how I'm going to pass the test. Thank you so much to Miguel uh, Acubiere, which is I had to practice many, many times for actually taking the time out of his very, very busy schedule to talk to me and to his son, Raul, for putting us in touch, who was watching an Office Hours live stream at the time. That was amazing uh, that we got in touch in that way. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. But if you were to put a gun to my head, don't do that, and ask me if warp drive will happen in our lifetime, I'm gonna lean towards probably not. Even if we have the theoretical solution, as I was trying to point out, the practical, the engineering part of that solution is so intractable right now. Having the mass energy of Jupiter or negative energy, these are things that we probably won't ever get our engineering hands and minds around, not unless we raise ourselves up to the next level of civilization. So it's, it's a fun idea that tests your physical knowledge of the universe, but are you going to be getting to Proxima Centauri in anything but economy class? I don't know. You're def he, that guy next to you, he's going to be wearing shorts and he's going to be hogging all of the armrest room for four years. Thanks for watching.